Well, welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the East-West Center in Washington. Delighted to have you today. And first of all, let me uh, express a Happy New Year wishes to all of you. Uh, may your 2020 be a very safe, productive uh, year. And um, great to have you join us for a program, which is a really auspicious way to start the year uh, with a, a good colleague, um, a very prolific writer and expert on issues on Asia Pacific security, and in particular the South China Sea, uh, Richard Hedarian, who's taught at uh, several universities, National Chengchi, Ateneo de Manila, uh, and it's also appears frequently in the press, both in writing and in interviews. And he has a new book out, uh, which has been noted here, the Indo-Pacific, Trump, China, and the New Struggle for Global Mastery, and I can't help but think the, the, the title of this is echoes a little bit of AJP Taylor's great book on European geopolitics of the 19th century, The Struggle for the Mastery of Europe, for those of you who are familiar with so, uh, It's in that vein that uh, Richard has agreed to talk about his new book and, and what he sees as the, uh, the trends and the trajectories in the region. He has a PowerPoint, so I've asked him to uh, go ahead and do the PowerPoint for approximately 45 minutes or so, and that should leave us about 30 to 40 minutes for Q&A. Just ground rules today, we are uh, live streaming, so there are people joining on the web and, and video, and um, all of the session today is on the record, uh, including your questions and comments uh, in the latter part of the program. So with that, again, Richard, thank you for agreeing to do this, and, right, and, and welcome. And uh, it's your show, so why don't I'll get out of the way so people can see your PowerPoint. Sure. And then we'll... I, I suppose I'm going to stand up, uh, otherwise the jet lag will get better for me. Uh, <laughs> I had a longer than usual flight via Doha this time, uh, rather than the Hindu, so I didn't pass through the Indo-Pacific, just the Indian and Atlantic Ocean. All right, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. I and Sato had a preview of, the, uh, preview of this uh, during our talk in Hudson the other month, and we just, you know, by the fly, I suggested why not we'll have a book event here. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to logistically arrange the book itself, but it's easily accessible in uh, major bookstores. It's a paperback version uh, by Paul Beer Frank Milag. It's just around 400 pages, uh, uh, and it's based on my uh, journalistic and academic writings, uh, starting actually with my uh, visit to Egypt in 2010, just months before the Arab Spring. In fact, my first book was about the Arab uprising. and. Uh, my background, cultural background, actually stretches from the Caspian Sea all the way to South China Sea, from Mediterranean all the way to the Pacific. Uh, so half of my family is probably in California and the rest is on the other side of the world. So this is also something personal to me as far as the Indo-Pacific is concerned. Now, I know here in DC, as far as uh, what in fact all around the world, the discussion right now is about uh, the aftermath of uh, General Soleimani's uh, killing. Uh, and Middle East is actually one part that I discuss in my book. But China, Southeast Asia was just so much that I dedicated only one chapter to the Middle East. And I got criticism from some of my colleagues, but perhaps I'll have to have a different book on that. But we can have a discussion about the Middle East, because as I and Sato were talking a while ago, what happens in the Middle East actually inevitably has implication for what happens in East Asia. Our fear here, our fear especially in Southeast Asia and East Asia is the United States will be even more distracted than it used to be in the past. And I'll show you some numbers later on that shows there is already anxiety about lack of engagement by this administration, especially in comparison to the Obama administration. Nonetheless, I just felt there's so much to talk about, but what I really want to talk about is uh, this whole discussion about Chinese hegemony. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I usually hear, the hackneyed, I would say, discourse, is that China has already won the game. Now, I come from the Philippines, one of our icons is Manny Pacquiao, and I would say that if this were boxing, we're just in round four, and this is going to go all the way to round 12 and probably even more. So it's still too early to talk about who has won Asia. It's really up for grabs. And in fact, to push the argument, what I'm going to discuss today, and this is based on uh, discussions with leaders across the region, with individuals, with policymakers, with ordinary people, with fishermen, with Coast Guard uh, uh, forces, with media, among others, is that uh, China has not won the game. And in fact, what we're talking about today is a premature bid for hegemony. There's, uh, I use the much more politically correct term, I use the word inchoate hegemony, but I would just push it a little bit and talk about premature hegemony. So why, why is it premature to talk about Chinese domination in Asia? Um, 
Now, as far as response to China and um, where we are in Asia vis-a-vis -vis China is concerned, I would use this, uh, this uh, the Kubler-Ross uh, group cycle. It, this is one of the best ways to understand where are different countries around the world when it comes to how they look at the in rising influence of China. The rising influence of China, I think, is uh, unquestionable. It's a fact. But the issue is whether it has reached a threshold of domination, whereby China can actually Finlandize and dictate uh, the policy and preferences of neighboring countries. Some countries, I would say, are in denial, or perhaps the country is not in denial, but the leaders are in denial. Case in point, President Duterte of the Philippines, I think he's quite in denial when it comes to threats from China, but not necessarily with his people and defense establishment. I'll discuss about that. Bargaining, that's clearly the case with Malaysia, with Prime Minister Mahathir calling for renegotiation, literally, bargaining of the Belt and Road Initiative. And I'll discuss later on also the December surprise of Malaysia uh, through a legal challenge at the United Nations for its extended continent. In fact, I was in Hainan Sanya just when President uh, Xi was launching the new Shandong aircraft carrier. The next day, the discussion was about, whoa, where did this come from as far as Malaysia is concerned? And then acceptance, acceptance that China is a challenge and we have to deal with them. And that's definitely the case in places, I would say, increasingly in the United States, but definitely in places like Taiwan, where I spent a lot of time in the last year. And Taiwan is going to have an election soon where the more China-skeptic president is supposed to uh, secure a re-election vis-a-vis the more China-leaning opposition. And then, of course, you have anger, which is clearly the case in Hong Kong. The anger is very clear. I've talked to protesters on the ground, to, to so-called kids on the ground, uh, and they're almost courageously fatalistic. Um, the, you always ask them, what do you think comes next? Do you think you can beat China? Their point is, we don't care. We have to make this fight. So I'm not surprised that the protests are continuing, uh, and they're, I expect to continue for the foreseeable future. And then, of course, there are countries who are in total depression, and <laughs> uh, they still cannot understand what's going on with China. And, the, and So this, I think, is one way to understand uh, where we are, as far as framing the discussion is concerned. Now, there are, I think, two figures that help us to understand what's happening in, in Asia, particularly in East Asia nowadays. And two figures are uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the Prime Minister of Singapore. I don't agree with everything he, I, he says. Uh, I kind of agree also with some people that perhaps he was a glorified mayor. After all, Singapore is a city-state. Um, but he knows much, or he knew much about China and the future of the world. Yeah. And the other one is, of course, Walter Benjamin. Uh, if you're familiar with him, it was a German uh, philosopher and philologist. Uh, of course, no, unfortunately, he passed away when he was trying to escape Nazi Germany. Now, of all the things that they said, the two quotes that stood out for me, first, when it comes to the economy, is when he said that the size of China's displacement of the world balance is such that the world must find a new balance. It has huge implications. His idea is that China is so big and consequential that its rise does not only require some tactical balance of power adjustment by other countries. Perhaps that could be done or that could have been done when Germany was under rise or Imperial Japan was under rise. China is just so big, the whole system will change. And we are feeling that disruption, to use the uh, cliche term nowadays, most especially in Southeast Asia, uh, which was uh, the uh, uh, ancient backyard of Imperial China. Uh, Walter Benjamin uh, also talked about how Behind every fascism, there's a failed revolution. Now, I'm not going to say that China is fascist, although what's happening in Xinjiang is bordering ethnic cleansing, but it's, that's a completely different issue. But it has implications for Indonesia and Malaysia. I'll discuss it later on. But the fascism is this big power rivalry, this brutal 18th century like big power rivalry that we're seeing. Uh, over the past few months, I've been reading uh, Massey's uh, book on Peter the Great and looking at all of those Northern War, Great Northern War, and how brutal and how predictably brutal uh, great power competition was. And looking at US and China, our fear is that we're going to have a return of that. Now, behind every fascism, there's a failed revolution. I think the fascism is, of course, this realist, zero-sum competition between US and China, which is worrying us. But the failed revolution is, this is where I'm more self-critical, coming from Southeast Asia, is the inability of ASEAN to create a Kantian perpetual peace through strong institutions that can preserve an inclusive security architecture. That is a failure that worries me a lot. Now, I spent many years in the Middle East. It's a Game of Thrones situation there. I'm very glad that in Southeast Asia we don't have that. So I give a lot of credit to Southeast Asia and, and ASEAN in particular, but definitely we can do better than that. Now, and this is where I think ASEAN is very important. Um, 
First of all, when it comes to ASEAN, we have to give credit where credit is due. If you're familiar with uh, Southeast Asia in the 1960s and up to early 1970s, this was the era of confrontancy. And this was more than just confrontancy. Uh, when I was going through the WikiLeaks, I came across some of the interesting uh, uh, messages whereby um, the leader, this is Razak Senior, back in the days, uh, messaged Britain for Britain to talk to Kissinger, to Kissinger to talk to Nixon, for Nixon to talk to Marcos so that they don't invade Sabah of Malaysia. In the 1960s, the Philippines had the most developed economy and military in the region. Malaysians were really scared of war. So the prospect of war was really present and uh, urgent during that time. And of course, you had the confrontancy with the Malayan Federation and of course Indonesia and then between Singapore and Malaysia. So the 60s was really a time of trouble. Uh, and Southeast Asia more, looked more like the Middle East of today. Uh, so in many ways, we have come a long way. To use the language of constructivism and international relations theory, in Southeast Asia, we have moved towards creation of a security community. Uh, and a security community whereby even the threat of use of force has almost become unthinkable as an instrument of foreign policy. Territorial disputes continue to be present there, maritime and land among Southeast Asian countries. We almost came to blow actually earlier this decade when Cambodia and Thailand mobilized on their border over that uh, historic temple, but Indonesia stepped in and actually encouraged the two countries to submit the case to ICJ, and that successfully happened. There are many non-traditional security concerns among Southeast Asian countries, but we never threaten war. And this is quite amazing because you're talking about a region which is arguably the most diverse in the world. You have a region whereby you have a small country like Brunei with a few hundred thousand population, and then you have a large country like Indonesia with 275 million people. In fact, Southeast Asian countries are not all small. Some of them are pretty huge, particularly Indonesia, but also Philippines and Vietnam with almost 100 million population. And then you have uh, Singapore with, what, $50,000 per capita, OECD level, and you have Myanmar barely $1,000. You have almost a Saudi-like absolute monarchy in Brunei, and then you have fiesta democracies in places like the Philippines, right? So it's a very diverse region. And the fact that we're able to create this community out of such a diversity, and all, not all diversity is actually uh, comes with congruity, sometimes it comes with conflict, it's in itself, I think, worth uh, giving credit to. Now, we also achieved that, in fact, unlike the EU, without any kind of Copenhagen criteria. Your entry into ASEAN is not based on meeting certain standards of development. So we were able to absorb <laughs> Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and less developed countries without creating significant dislocation within the ASEAN. Unlike the EU, where they have the Copenhagen criteria that creates some degree of consonance in the economic and political institutions among member countries. In ASEAN, we're also successfully pushed for ASEAN free trade ahead of schedule, way ahead of schedule, so much so that we became too complacent, if not hubristic, that we could finalize a common market by 2015. Obviously, as we expected, it didn't happen, but we are moving towards that direction of making the flow of labor, capital, and technology much more easier among ASEAN countries, not to mention we already have visa-free arrangement, which makes it much more easier for us to have interaction. Uh, in terms of non-traditional security, uh, the ASEAN also has come a significant way. Uh, in Malacca Street, there are joint patrols among four or five countries against piracy and terrorism. After the siege of Malawi and Southern Philippines by ISIS, you have trilateral joint patrols between Philippines, Malaysia, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and Indonesia in the Celebes and Sulu Sea. Uh, you have more and more intelligence sharing among countries. And now, in the past, actually, Singapore had pushed for a counterterrorism convention on a national level, and then it became unilateral, and now it's adopted by entire ASEAN. So there's a lot of successes also when it comes to non-traditional security, but I think the greatest thing that ASEAN brings to smaller countries that could otherwise be less relevant in the international system is convening power. Um, and this convening power, power matters. I remember in 2017, at the height of tensions in, in the Korean peninsula, in the same room, you could see uh, Secretary Tillerson and the foreign, foreign minister of North Korea. Since the uh, collapse of the six-party talks in 2009, there are very few opportunities for leaders uh, in the West, for major powers in this region, and the North Korean foreign minister to be in the same room. That was very, very significant. And President Duterte, during his chairmanship of ASEAN that year, was able to meet all parties and push for more engagement and dialogue as far as the issue is concerned. Uh, in fact, South Korea had its first ASEAN-Korea uh, uh, international conference also that year, whereby South Korea openly asked ASEAN to help in this regard. As you may know, ASEAN is relevant to North Korea. I noticed that when I visited North Korea in 2018, because a lot of ASEAN countries are 
one of the very few alternatives to China for North Korea to deal with the rest of the world, and most of the time illegally. So actually Thailand and the Philippines are one of the major smuggling routes and trade partners of, 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 of North Korea. And now North Korea is significantly dependent only on one power, China. And its convening power also allows for smaller countries like the Philippines or Vietnam to bring all major uh, actors there. So back in 2017, I remember you had Narendra Modi, Shinzo Abe, Donald Trump, top leaders of the world all in the same place, right? And wearing Filipino barong, which was quite interesting to see them in that costume. So this convening power is something that I think we have to take into consideration and it provides some of the very few, if not last remaining platform for interaction among rival powers. Now, nonetheless, as Arthur Miller said, an era can be considered over when its basic illusions have been exhausted. I think we became a victim of our success. We were so successful beyond wildest imagination in creating a security community among ourselves that we became complacent in terms of our ability, perhaps falsely, to convince major powers to incorporate our norms and values, particularly in terms of peaceful management of disputes. Uh, and this is partly the fault of ASEAN. Now, ASEAN operates on two principles, Mushawara and Muafara. Uh, these are actually Arabic terms, uh, consultation and consensus. The problem is when it comes to Muafara, if you're familiar with Arabic, the original word Muafara is much closer to European Council's understanding of what consensus is. <laughs> consensus does not require everyone to be on board on the same issue 100% all the time, right? It's, it's more about the idea of having enough common denominator to move forward on a certain issue. In the ASEAN, unfortunately, when it comes to security political issues, not economics, but security political issues, our understanding of that is actually unanimity. And by virtue of unanimity-based decision-making, we shot ourselves in foot. Now, that's easy when it comes to dealing with issues among ourselves, but once you involve big powers, especially like China, it's almost impossible to get unanimity on sensitive issues, particularly like the South China Sea. I very much agree with colleagues uh, like Bila Harikaskan in Singapore who said that South China Sea is where the parameters of US-China competition is most apparent. Some other folks would talk about essentially the Tukididas trap being most prominent in the South China Sea. So for ASEAN not to have a significant say or influence on the trajectory of the disputes in the South China Sea, I think is quite disappointing. Now, what are the problems with the unanimity-based decision-making? First of all, it's unfair by nature because it gives veto power to each and every member of ASEAN regardless of their degree of interest and their degree of contribution to the issue, right? Now, this is where I'm actually counterintuitive because in ASEAN, one of the common refrain is Cambodia bashing. So everyone bashes Cambodia because Cambodia is supposed to be a satellite of China and they sabotage things. But I actually sympathize with Hun Sen, not on 99% of issue, but on this issue. I remember twice, especially in 2015, Hun Sen, this is before the Philippine Arbitration Award came out, he was essentially shouting and saying, it's none of our business what happens in the South China Sea. We have no direct interest there. And yet Cambodia was forced on the issue. Right? And it's forced because you need unanimity on that. Now, if you have China breathing on your shoulders and you have one third of your national budget or aid coming from one country, it's inevitable that Cambodia or Laos and those countries have to vote in a certain direction. Right? So this puts actually some ASEAN members in a very difficult situation that they don't deserve. So instead of just criticizing Cambodia for blocking discussion on South China, I criticize the unanimity based decision making process that gives de facto veto to Cambodia, which makes them de facto vulnerable to China's pressure, right? And uh, as Bob Marley said, mental slavery is a problem. So sometimes some of the proxies of China or countries that are dependent on China already internalize what China wants before making their decisions. Not in the past, in 2012, Hu Jintao actually visited Cambodia before Cambodia blocked the South China Sea issue. It was much more, uh, I would say, crude back in the days, but now it's much more internalized. So the result is that, you know, sometimes ASEAN only has one job to do, and that's to release a strong statement, and even that, they're not capable to do that. Because if you don't have unanimity, you don't have a joint statement. What you have is what you call chairman statement. And over the past few years, you see more and more frequency of chairman statements coming, coming out. And this is not only in South China Sea. Even the ethnic cleansing in the Rakhine state in Myanmar, obviously Myanmar blocked that. 
and Malaysia wanted a strong statement, so the Philippines and other countries had to release also chairman statement. So the chairman statement's regularity is already a reflection of this deadlock that we're facing within the ASEAN. Now, the other problem with the ASEAN also is, uh, the jet lag is setting in. <laughs> the other problem with the ASEAN also is, I think, <clears throat> our cult of dialogue. We love discussion. Now, process is important, but it's not more important than outcome. And we should not worship the process. Now, this cult of dialogue is very much present when it comes to the negotiations of code of conduct, which has been going on for a very, very long time. Do I have it here? No, I don't have it here. But uh, you are familiar with the code of conduct. So the code of conduct is supposed to provide the rules of the road for how countries behave in the South China Sea. Now, the idea of a legally binding code of conduct was there on the ASEAN table as early as 1996-1997. By 2002, there was a declaratory statement, the Declaration of Counterparts in the South China Sea, but the implicit message there was within figures we have to find it as illegally binding. It's already 2020, right? And China is still telling us, do not rush. So you have more than 15 years of discussions, and every time we have this, I would say, very interesting celebration. Oh, finally, we have, we have a title for our code of conduct. Finally, we have an outline for our code of conduct. Finally, we have a single draft of code of conduct. And it's interesting, when I was in Hainan last month, we were having discussions with our Chinese colleagues and, uh, and experts about code of conduct, and even they were not sure what they wanted out of code of conduct, whether this is legally binding. And if it's legally binding, whose law and whose interpretation of international law? Initially, I was pushing for legally binding code of conduct because my idea is if it's not going to be legally binding, this is a waste of time. What's the added value? You already have the DOC. Uh, and if you look at the Article 5 of the DOC, it's very clear. No unilateral action. Quote, unquote, what's happening in terms of reclamation and militarization. China violated it nonetheless. But if it's going to be legally binding, and it's not going to be on clause, or it's not going to be conventional interpretation of on clause, if it's not going to be the arbitration award of 2016, if it's going to be Chinese understanding of international law, then you'd rather not have legally binding because that will make it even worse. So this is the situation we're in. But even more worrisome for me is the development happening over the past few years. So the Philippines was the ASEAN chairman in 2017, and now is the country coordinator for ASEAN and China. So the Philippines effectively oversees negotiation of code of conduct until 2021, which is supposed to be the deadline for finalization of the code of conduct per Li Keqiang. The interesting thing is that in 2017, President Duterte pushed the envelope further, not in the right direction, but in the wrong direction. How? For a long time, ASEAN position is non-alignment. We don't align either with the US against China or China against US. But something happened in 2017. President Duterte expressly came out and said, back off. He said, the disputes in the South China Sea, quote unquote, should be left untouched by external powers. The situation is stable. This is essentially the talking points of the Chinese foreign ministry. I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just talking about the coincidence of the overlap of statement. So essentially, ASEAN, under influence of countries like China, is telling US, China, US, Japan, and other countries to back off. It was very interesting, because I remember in 2017, during the ASEAN Regional Forum, the then Filipino foreign minister, uh, Alan Peter Cayetano, he came out with a statement where he effectively said, it is our sovereign right not to assert our sovereign right. Mm -hmm. What was the context? The context was, Japan, Australia, and the United States released a trilateral statement suggest, uh, making it clear that the arbitration award of July uh, 12, 2016 is final and binding, and that China should abide by it. And then you had the Philippine foreign minister coming saying, whoa, 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 it's really not up to you to tell us or tell China that they should respect our rights. It's up to us if we want them to respect our rights. So it was a very weird situation going on there, to put it most euphemistically, right? So this, I think, has worsen the situation, has pushed ASEAN towards greater peripherality. But what was the catch? The argument of people like President Duterte and like-minded people across the region is, if you provoke China, like what Philippines did under President Aquino by taking China to international court and eventually winning it and embarrassing China, is that the situation will get worse. So one of the theses of China boys in the Philippines was that because the Philippines Push for the arbitration award in January 2013, you had the reclamation by December of 2013. As if China's policy is based on the policy of just one country in Southeast Asia. But that was the line of argument. So the argument was this, if you become nice to China, whatever that means, then China will actually reciprocate and become less aggressive. The question is, 
Is that being borne by facts? No. The fact of the matter is that since actually ASEAN has softened its position, particularly countries like the Philippines, swinging wildly in the other direction, right? China has upped the ante. So you have actually further militarization of the disputes. You have deployment of anti-cruise ballistic missiles, surface turbulent missiles. In fact, uh, as uh, Admiral Davidson said, what we have is now a great wall of SAMs, not only SAMs, but surface air missiles in the area. You also have quite a troubling situation. The Chinese Coast Guard now is effectively under the People's Liberation Army Navy, so they're no longer just a white hall. They're an extension of the Great Hall forces of, the, of, of China, and you also have more and more aggressive and large naval exercises in the area. So the situation actually has got worse. Now, if you're familiar with what's happening also in Southeast Asia, uh, in June last year, uh, allegedly a Chinese militia force hit and sunk a Filipino fishing boat in the Reed Bank, Rect Bank area we call it, which is very energy rich. And China is pushing for us under the shotgun to actually negotiate a joint development agreement. And of course, a few months later on, we also had the situation with Vietnam, months long <laughs> standoff over the Vanguard Bank and most recently also in the Natuna Sea off the waters of, of you know, Indonesia. Nonetheless, as depressing as that is, not all is lost, right? This is where my argument comes in. There are three reasons to be optimistic that China has not dominated Asia, and, and the game in the South China Sea is not over yet. Last time I checked, Philippines still controls nine features in the South China Sea, and it's, up, it's upgrading its situation on the ground. Malaysia still has five. Vietnam has between, what, 25 to 26, depending on how you count them. It's not like other countries have lost, but it's definitely China is gaining strength on the ground. Now, if you're familiar with Antonio Gramsci, the Italian thinker, he made a distinction between war of position and war of maneuver. No one is talking about war of maneuver yet, which is like war. But definitely in terms of positioning, China is a much better position. And their militarization is different because it allows China to project power from the occupied islands in ways that other countries in the region cannot. So the supply lines of other uh, smaller countries is in danger. But as top generals in US and admirals will tell you, if the situation gets into war in a matter of hours, the US can take out those fake islands. And perhaps climate change will take care of them if we have more time in the next five to 10 years. Nonetheless, there are reasons to be optimistic that the game is not over. The first one to keep in mind is the endurance of American power, in theory, we can discuss about how President Trump is using it. But in theory, America's power is still resilient. I think one of the best works I've seen by that is by Michael Beckley, his uh, international security article, China Century, in his new book, Unrivaled, when he talks about the notion of net power. This is where epistemological correction is very important. Because one of the problems in media and among policymakers is that we talk about China as a superpower and dominant by just looking at their gross national product or by looking at their military budget. But what you really have to look at is net power, meaning assets minus liabilities. The fact of the matter is that China is still a developing country. The fact of the matter is China still has hundreds of millions of people in poverty. The fact of the matter is that China still has a lot of structural problems, financially, ecologically, otherwise, and China is yet to build a proper and robust welfare program as it reaches a demographic winter by 2024, 2025. So if you look at net power, meaning your human resources, your cutting edge technology, the resources, surplus resources you have at your disposal for projecting power, the United States is still ahead of China by a huge distance. So if you look at, for instance, uh, per capita income, China is not necessarily catching up. If you look at research and development, this is very interesting. And there's a lot of discussion about China produces like one million engineers or whatever every few months. But Further research shows that a lot of these uh, people are actually vocationally trained. There's a lot of discussion about Chinese scientific production going up, but if you look at the citation rate of Chinese uh, papers vis-a-vis -vis the American papers or Japanese papers, the citation is still very low. So there's also a huge problem in terms of quality versus just quantity. If you look at uh, uh, patents, if you look at biotechnology, still ahead. There's only there's one area though, but this is very crucial, and I think Kai Fu Li's book, uh, AI Superpowers, very carefully analyzes this. In artificial intelligence, though, China is putting up a good fight. But that's also because China, for lack of <clears throat> privacy rights, can use volume of data to dominate certain dimensions of AI, not necessarily all. I think Kai Fuli's uh, argument was that out of seven dimensions of AI, China dominates three, US dominates three, and then the rest is up for grabs. So in that area, China has some headway. But a lot of experts will tell you that artificial intelligence is not only about data, it's also about innovation and how to make use of that. So the fact of the matter is that China is 
gaining ground, it's catching up in certain way, but nowhere near in terms of its net power, if we look at its overall resources. The other thing is this, I'm very critical of the Trump administration when it comes to its Middle East policy, I think it's very reckless what they did recently vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran, uh, but when it comes to Asia, of course the two are connected, there have been certain things that are very assuring to us. First of all, you see regularization of the uh, FONOS, uh, the uh, Freedom of Navigation Operations. Under the Obama administration, they were not regular. There was a lot of wishy-washiness on that. And then uh, we know for a fact that the Pentagon had to get green light directly from White House all the time before going with the phone off. So there was a lot of regulatory uh, restrictions, bureaucratic restrictions. Um, so that has changed under Trump administration. There's more prerogative given to the Pentagon when it comes to phone offs. And the phone offs are not only more regular, but they'll have two other important changes. One change is they're more aggressive in a sense that sometimes there are two warships deployed within the 12 knot nautical miles of Chinese artificial islands. That's important because if you move within 12 nautical miles, you're challenging the Chinese claim over that island per se. Because the only way you can pass through, uh, and you, I mean, you cite right of innocent passage, which was the mistake under Obama administration. You cannot do that. If you pass within 12 nautical miles and you say right of innocent passage, that means you implicitly recognize that they have a maritime claim that area. But that's not happening under Trump administration. But the second important thing, uh, Sato, is you also have fun ups now in areas which were not covered by the Obama administration. Most crucially, Scarborough Shoal. This is the next phase that we're looking at, whether China will complete the triangle of Spratly's Paracels and Scarborough Shoal. And many experts will tell you that one reason China has not claimed Scarborough Shoal yet is because of constant American surveillance and presence in that area, which implicitly <coughs> says there will be a response if China reclaims the Scarborough Shoal. And the Philippine military actually backs, back, backs that up. Uh, Secretary Lorenzana, the Philippine Defense uh, Minister, said uh, it's too close for comfort if China reclaims the Scarborough Shoal. The second thing is expansion of regional military footprint and defense cooperation. In fact, despite all of the back and forth diplomatic spat between President Duterte and President Trump, the foreign military finance of the Philippines has doubled over the past few years. And interestingly, um, the number of joint military exercises between Philippines and the US is the highest ever in the country's history, in the two countries' history. It was close to 200 last year. It's the highest number among any of the US in the Pacific partner. This was very clear in the Pentagon's Indo-Pacific strategy paper. You can find it there. The other important development is the U.S. Coast Guard for the first time since the Cold War is having more regular presence, including joining phone ops operations by the U.S. Pentagon, and also building capacity from Vietnam to Philippines and Malaysia and Indonesia. And the fourth thing is, this is quite underdeveloped. Yes, TPP was canceled, that's a huge problem, but there's more discussions about build infrastructure as kind of a counterpart uh, to the BRI of China. Now, the idea there is not to match China dollar per dollar. U.S. is a different political system. It's not like China whereby you can essentially command the state companies to invest in the country or not. Uh, but at least there's a recognition that there has to be something done in terms of the infrastructure competition. And the competition here is more in terms of the quality of infrastructure. It's about the regulatory mechanisms. And we see this bearing fruit. So much so that President Xi Jinping uh, last uh, May, during the second BRI forum, openly acknowledged that there should be more focus on debt sustainability and environmental sustainability issues. So China is already recognizing this criticism that is coming up from the Quad and other countries. I have to a little bit go faster. Sorry, I took some time. Now, the question here is, how do co major countries in the region uh, view U.S. and China? Who are they more comfortable with? <coughs> if you look at the Pew surveys, it's very clear that Key countries across the region, from Japan, Philippines, South Korea, Australia, among others, still are much more comfortable with the United States as a world power and as a leader in this part of the world. And this is in spite of the leadership of President Trump, which also went with reduction in terms of confidence in the ability of U.S. leader to do right. So this shows the resilience of uh, American influence and, let's say, popularity in the region in spite of concerns with President Trump's temperament. Uh, this is also how countries see their top ally. So in places like the Philippines, when the presentation were asked who say their country uh, they can most rely on, when they were asked about the United States, 64% in the Philippines, 71% in South Korea, 63% in Japan, 4% in South Korea, where, so let's say China, and only 9% in Philippines. Maybe that's Duterte and his friends and <laughs> some regions, but it's a significant number who are still more comfortable with the United States. It's very sticky. 
stickiness is, I think, the, the, the term of the, our era, zeitgeist. So the stickiness is something that we have to keep in mind. And in fact, maybe we'll do a different presentation on this topic. But we also did some internal survey among top defense officials in the Philippines. U.S. still came on top by far compared to China when it comes to their preferability of alliance. So this opinion is also reflected among the defense establishment in the Philippines based on some of the studies we have done in the past few years. Now in the ASEAN, there were questions about, so everyone is saying, oh, BRI, China's economic influence, it will dominate the region. In fact, most ASEAN countries are actually very skeptical about whether the BRI is favorable to them. Most of them believe that this is about pushing ASEAN into the Chinese orbit. So 52% said that in, in Brunei. Uh, in the Philippines, 38% said that. So the skepticism is more about BRI than actually open arms support. So let's not be too fooled or carried away by some overly excited statements coming from ASEAN countries. Oh, China will help, help us with infrastructure and development. This is not born by actually opinion of policymakers on the ground, and definitely people. Uh, yes, uh, we, when ASEAN countries, so this is a survey by ICS, Institute for Strategic and International Studies, not ISIS, ICS, uh, in <laughs> Singapore, and they ask experts in ASEAN. When you were asking about uh, China's influence, again, you'll see that there's a lot of skepticism uh, about China. This is also interesting, okay, so this is where there is some concerns with Trump administration, that under Trump administration, there's a decrease, substantially and decrease. So more, majority of people uh, suggest that under Trump, there's more disengagement from the region. But there's also skepticism towards China. But what I think is even more interesting to me is, what is that I'm not showing here? Did it get blocked? Yeah. Uh -oh. The most interesting thing to me in this survey is because it doesn't. Okay, sorry. The most interesting thing to me is that when it, when people are asked about the US and China, actually a lot of Southeast Asian countries choose a third partner, and that's Japan. And we'll discuss here how Japan is very very important. And the second reason why we should not be worried about China taking over Asia is the um, the resilience of middle powers, particularly their influence. And case in point is. <coughs> This is again, uh, should, am I being sabotaged? This happened. Okay, sorry. So when it comes to the global balance of power, I think Japan is not considered as a great power, but it's still the third largest country. I think if you talk about to keep it a strap, which is a significant and abrupt change in positions, Japan has felt that more than any country when it comes to China-Japan rivalry. Uh, in, in just 15 years ago, Japan's military spending was almost twice that of China, and its GDP was larger by 40%. Within a span of 10 years, China has more than doubled its GDP compared to that of Japan, and its defense spending is even significantly larger. Now, I think one of the problems also is that people are not looking at China's spending in PPP, because a lot of Chinese defense spending is also from domestic resources. So if you take that in consideration, it's Japan and China who experienced the most significant shift in power over the past few years. Nonetheless, Japan preserves significant amount of influence, particularly in Southeast Asia, and especially under Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who in many ways, I think, is the brains behind the whole Indo-Pacific discussion. So, are we, okay, so I hope, uh, okay, so can we go? Can we start here? Yeah. Okay, so this map is very important because everyone talks about the BRI map. But if you look at infrastructure development in Southeast Asia, actually the country who is ahead of everyone, both in quantity and quality, is not China, but it's still Japan. And we're actually talking about new infrastructure projects, not stock of infrastructure projects. The stock of infrastructure projects, Japan has been way ahead of everyone for a very, very long time, you know? Uh, and I mean, if you go to places like the Philippines, for instance, you see a lot of major projects are actually Japan Philippines projects. But even the new projects that are coming in over the past 10 years in Southeast Asia are also from Japan. So that map was supposedly showing that. Um. <laughs> um, sorry, this thing is just being, probably the weather. <laughs> I hope it's just the weather. It always happens when I, I start with my China bashing and then move towards Japan. <laughs> it's almost suspicious, yeah. Maybe it's my friends in the Philippines. Eh? Jeez. 
Okay, maybe we'll just, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm nervous now. To, to touch it. Okay, so this is the map of Japan's infrastructure project all across the region. It's an integrated coherent project, which is very, very different from the BRI. If you have followed BRI, I think we already have BRI Arctic, BRI North Pole, BRI South America. It's obviously uh, a fluid, flexible, grand vision that can adjust any time. There's nothing fixed about it. But as far as the Japanese are concerned, their projects are actually concrete, literally, and they're moving forward, and they're coherent. And in 2015, uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe actually said that he's going to dedicate $140 billion in terms of infrastructure development to the region. I'm not saying that Japan alone can cover the infrastructure needs. The ADB said that it could run up to $1 trillion in the span of 10 years. But so far, among those who are committing on the ground, Japan is way ahead. Can we go to the next one? I'm a little bit scared. So this is a, <laughs> this is a feed solutions data. I'm sorry about this, Sarah. So if you look at here, especially in key countries in ASEAN, uh, Philippines, <coughs> Vietnam, and even in Indonesia, Japan is either way ahead in terms of number and the, uh, and the the scale of infrastructure projects, or at least it's close. So in, in Vietnam, uh, where's Vietnam? So Vietnam is 74 projects by Japan versus only 25 by China. And in fact, a lot of people in Hanoi are pissed off because their metro line is being built by China, while the folks in, I would call it Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City, their, theirs is being built by Japan. So there's a lot of comparison going on between the two of them, right? And we know that Vietnam is the one, the rising power within the uh, Southeast Asia, and they're really benefiting from the trade war, of course. Everyone is shifting their investments there. In the Philippines, it's almost, over, it's almost even more pathetic. It's 29 versus 8. I'll discuss that a little bit more later on if we have time. Actually, out of 8, only 2 are going to move forward, and 2 are actually not big ticket. They're only a few million dollars, and they actually could be ecologically damaging and have very questionable provisions, assuming they will ever be implemented. While in the case of Japan, they have two major projects in the Philippines. One is the first metro line that will be built in Metro Manila. Thank God, so that it will not be the worst traffic in the world. Um, I literally can finish articles while stuck in traffic. Um, and, and the other one is the North-South Commuters Highway, which connects the most industrial regions of the Philippines. So Japan has the most important, biggest project in the most important countries in the ASEAN. Cambodia and Laos, okay, that's good for China. It's a different regulatory environment. Maybe China can be more helpful there. But in the more developed and more influential countries in the ASEAN, Japan is still way ahead of the curve. Next. Uh, so this is, again, it gives you a sense. So in Vietnam, in Philippines, so look at the Philippines, like China versus uh, Japan. Um, so it's, it's a huge difference. Now, of course, Chinese are investing a lot in the Philippines, but these are investments like online casinos, whereby they employ two to 300,000 Chinese. Not much job is going to the Filipinos. And we don't know what kind of dodgy stuff going on inside. Actually, we know what's going on, but that's a different topic. <laughs> Next. So actually, China, we are creating jobs for China. So thanks to Duterte, we're creating jobs for the Chinese people. They have to be thankful to us. Uh, now, if, if you look at it, it's not only uh, Japan. Actually, both Australia and India have also pushed for different infrastructure development initiatives in cooperation with Singapore. And the focus of these infrastructure projects and capacity building projects, again, is not to match China dollar per dollar, but the push for certain norms and regulatory regimes which is in consonance with the interests of smaller countries. And as far as ASEAN countries are concerned, the more the merrier, because it gives them more options. But definitely they don't need, and they don't want projects that comes with long-term debt trap. And that brings us to the third, let's skip that, okay. Um, yeah, I have a picture with Duterte too, but I'd rather just have the picture that he has with my book, not together, I'll be in trouble. Um, so, over the past few years, I had the chance also to talk to different leaders, Prime Minister Mahathir, Tsai Ing-wen, President Duterte, among others. Uh, and, and the sense I get is that the, the third thing that is usually underestimated or, or, or overlooked in common discussions about Asia is, is the agency, right? And astuteness, strategic astuteness of smaller countries. In fact, even countries like Cambodia and Laos, if you look at them, they also try to diversify their foreign policy. The de facto default position of Southeast Asian countries is that they don't want to fall under any kind of colonialism again. They have enough of colonialism. Whether it's Eastern and Western, it doesn't matter. And the fact that matters is that Western colonialism lasted for 250 years. Eastern colonialism, that is Chinese tributary system, was millennia old. So we're actually even more familiar and anxious about the return of that rather than that of the West. Now, if you look at Southeast Asian countries, over the past few years, you also see a lot of balancing act. Now, in, when it comes to President Duterte, I think he went a little bit overboard, but in the first year or so, I was a little bit more supportive of President Duterte because I felt 
that we were taken a little bit for granted by the United States. Uh, we had huge concerns, especially under the Obama administration. We felt that Philippines was pushed uh, to take on China through the arbitration award, among other things. But when it came to crucial moments, the U.S. was not there. At least two instances, at least two instances. One was in 2012 during the Scar Marshall standoff, where it was the United States. China eventually took over the area. Yes, later on they came to prevent militarization, but it was slightly too late. But the second one was after the arbitration award came out. I remember this very well. This is July 13, July 14, 2016. Um, right after the arbitration award came out, Australia and Japan came out very strong statements saying the arbitration award is final and binding. President Obama nonetheless sent Susan Rice uh, to, to Beijing. And it came off like... And, and, and the supposed mission was to go to Beijing to calm down tensions, as if China was the aggrieved, insulted party, not like they were the one who were the outlaw. And we felt that the Obama administration was not strongly behind us at the most crucial moment. And it was precisely that lack or ambivalence in terms of commitment during the Obama administration that I think strengthened the hand of people like Obama, uh, people like Duterte, to say that maybe we have to cut a deal with the Chinese or do certain recalibration. And this is where I think you have to appreciate or understand where President Duterte was coming at first. Now, what comes later on is a completely different book, book, book and discussion. Now, when it comes to Malaysia, we also saw a very significant shift over the past few years. So Prime Minister Mahathir was very much known for his anti-Western sentiment, suddenly turned into one of the biggest and most prominent critics of China, particularly on the issue of the BRI. So one of the central policies of Prime Minister Mahathir in his first year in office was to push for a renegotiation or cancellation of major Chinese projects. Interestingly, in August in 2018, Mahathir, in the Great People's Hall, inside China, he warned against new colonialism. That was quite, uh, I would say, brave of him, if not audacious of him, for him to do that. And very interestingly for Malaysia, my sense with Malaysians is that what they're doing is sequencing. So for at least 12 months, actually 14 months, Prime Minister Mahathir hammered the Chinese on the BRI issue. He eventually got cancellation or redrawing. I think he got $6 billion uh, dollars of, of discounts or adjustments. But once that was a little bit handled, he shifted gears and now he's pushing back against China on the South China Sea issue. So interestingly, in December, last year's December, Malaysia submitted, uh, so these are, can I show that? Because Sorry, because I have different kinds of performance depending what visuals I have, right? That would be a little bit more colorful. So these are some of the, yeah. So these are some of the things I want you to look at. So, okay, so, the, so okay, this is the, the <laughs> still alive, he has my book, so okay, I hope. <laughs> still fine. So this is, um, this is China's popularity, negative 24 um, by the middle of 2000. Uh, and 19. So despite best efforts of President Duterte to portray China as an ally of the Philippines, an important partner, it's very much clear to the majority of people, uh, at least from the perspective of the majority of people, they don't see China actually as a reliable partner. And the views are extremely negative. And in a democratic, wild democracy like the Philippines, that has huge implications once Duterte's term ends. One of the big questions I always get when I'm in China is what happens after Duterte, right? Because it could swing significantly again after 2022. Even if his daughter wins, I think, even if his daughter, uh, Sarah, will not have the same policy. Now, interestingly, uh, if you look at the Philippines, so when people were asked, should the Philippines assert the arbitration award of 2016, 90%, more than 90% said, we should do that. Mm -hmm. This is the public opinion. So when pe they, people say President Duterte is popular, that's, a, that's something that we have to really break down. But obviously, he's not popular enough to convince people on the question of China. And more interestingly, this is important because the military looks at two things. Overall approval ratings of the president, they took out already two presidents in the past 35 years or so. So they cannot touch the third because he's overall popular. But on this issue, they know that the people are critical of the third and the China position. That's why the military is emboldened, uh, not to mention, as far as the Chinese projects are concerned, a lot of them are not coming to fruition. As I said, out of eight big ticket projects, only two are moving forward. And even those two are controversial and not sure. But the most important thing that has happened right now is the Philippine military is sensing public opinion. And with the confidence of the public opinion, they're actually pushing for even tighter cooperation, security cooperation with the US, but also Japan and Australia. In 2018, for the first time since the end of Second World War, Japan deployed uh, an armored vehicle for an overseas joint exercise. This is significant. Uh, war games came back after a temporary cancellation in 2017. 
And we also had the first ever airborne exercise since the end of Second World War between the Philippine forces in America. These are significant things that you have to keep in mind. So the, the endurance of Philippine-U.S. security cooperation has uh, out, outdone <laughs> President Duterte's best effort of so-called pivot to China. In fact, despite all the positive things between Philippines and China, including five visits to China and zero to the United States, which is likely going to be the case until 2022, um, Philippines and China have not signed any relevant defense agreement together, zero so far. While defense agreements, strategic agreements with other countries is moving forward, including the enhanced defense cooperation with the United States. And then in case of Malaysia, you openly have Mahathir questioning that, and this is very interesting. So when Mahathir was in Manila, I interviewed him, and I asked him, is it okay to get investment from China? He openly said, you have to be careful about that. And then the presidential palace had to respond to that because he warned the Philippines uh, that you have to be concerned about debt trap. So, so Mahathir is actually a rallying point across the region for being more skeptical about blindly uh, uh, welcoming Chinese investments. Now, interestingly, as Malaysia has sorted out the BRI issue, the economic issue, now they shift into the second, which is on the South China Sea issue. Mahathir was a little bit wishy-washy on that for quite some time. He said general things like, we need demilitarization of the disputes, but what does that mean? But now, in December, they, they submitted a second extended continental shelf claim. They submitted one in 2009, which pissed off the Chinese and kind of compelled them to come with the nine dash line. Now they have a second one. And when China pushed back, they openly said that China's nine dash line is ridiculous. This is a very strong statement coming from Malaysia. Now, interestingly, I was telling this Sato a while ago, if you look at the submission of Malaysia, it's dated, I think, 2017 May. So that means this was prepared already two or three years ago, but for some reason, obviously we know why, Najib did not submit it. Mahathir inherited it, but waited this time, and I think he feels now it's the time to push it. In fact, Mahathir said, after two years of stabilization domestically, you're gonna see more of me internationally, so this is the sign. And I'm not sure it's also a good sign for Anwar if he's waiting to become the prime minister. So I think uh, Mahathir, in fact, Mahathir openly said last year that he sees, he feels one of the big problems in ASEAN is that he doesn't have a clear leader, right? So maybe he's trying to step up to the plate because the territory doesn't seem to play that game. But interestingly, Vietnam also in November openly said that they may consider arbitration award and tangentially uh, invoke the Philippines arbitration award in 2016. In fact, Malaysia, also invoked the Philippines uh, uh, Arbitration Award, and most recently, Indonesia also did the same by saying there's no legal basis uh, to, to China's claims off the coast of Natuna Sea. In fact, in 2017, Malaysia and Indonesia has openly renamed the area, I'm gonna finish in eight minutes or five minutes, Nor they renamed it to North Natuna Sea to assert their rights, and if you're familiar with the former Maritime Fisheries uh, Sec uh, Secretary Minister, Susi, um, Susie Dragon, uh, I think she had the dragon tattoo or something. She blew up a lot of uh, vessels, including Chinese vessels in the area. She had a very tough uh, position on that. Now, Indonesia's position is very important. I'm actually not saying that Indonesia is turning against China, but what Indonesia says matters. In 2008, Indonesia submitted the continental shelf claim, extended continental shelf claim in North Sumatra. Immediately the next year, Vietnam and Malaysia also did the same, but in the South China Sea. In 2015, before the arbitration of the Philippines came out, Indonesia openly asked China to clarify the exact coordinates of the nine dash line. For heaven's sake, what is exactly your claim? Because if it's fuzzy, then you're, you're pissing off everyone and you're claiming everything. If you claim nothing specifically, you're claiming everything. So this was also position of Indonesia. In 2018, very interestingly, during the ASEAN and Australia summit uh, in Sydney, uh, Jokowi openly suggested maybe we need joint patrols by non claimants in Southeast Asia in parts of South China Sea to de-escalate tensions. Obviously, this did not also sit well with our Chinese friends, and now they're openly saying there's no basis to your nine dash line claim, and especially your claims off the coast of Natuna. And over the past five or six years, Indonesia has been uh, bolstering its strategic presence in the area, including the deployment of helicopters and F-16 fighters to the area, not to mention more and more naval and maritime cooperation with the United States. Now, they're not openly discussing that for understandable reason, but this is happening on the ground. These are the developments on the ground. I'm not even talking about the other important developments. Uh, what's happening in Xinjiang is pissing off a lot of people, especially in Muslim countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, recently, you had not only Mahathir coming out very strong against that, but the top imam, a religious leader in Malaysia, suggesting that we have to boycott Chinese products. Well, good luck with that. But the fact that you openly have discussions of boycott of Chinese products 
and portrayal of China as a as a major aggressor against uh, Uyghur uh, or Uyghurs, Muslims, it's in itself is an important issue. In fact, if you watch the Indonesian elections last year, interestingly, it was not a discussion much about economics and infrastructure, which everyone expected in an emerging market like Indonesia. The discussion was really identity politics centered on two issues, Islam and China. And these two issues are going to be more and more intertwined in the sociology of these countries. So it's not economics, but sociology and identity politics, which is gaining ground. In fact, I was telling my Chinese friends is that you always talk about the sentiments of Chinese people has been hurt by whatever, whatever. Guess what? We also have sentiments too. You're not the only emotional people. We're even more telenovela than you people. If you have nationalism, we also have nationalism. So even if China wants to co-op or is successful in co-opting some elites, they have two problems. The elites can change by counter elite or that elite could also change its position depending on domestic politics. In fact, President Duterte himself said he has three red lines vis-a-vis -vis China. One of the red lines was reclamation of Scarborough Shoal. I don't think, I cannot foresee a situation where Duterte will not do anything or his administration will not do anything if China moves forward with militarizing the Scarborough Shoal. Now we're gonna to move towards the important issues. Um, I just wanna say that, so a while ago I raised some question about, I have five minutes, about epistemology of power, how we understand power. That you have to look at net power, not just grass power. But I have to, I want to raise also another issue, which is the ontology of power. I think our mistake here is that when we look at Asia, we understand power as arboreal, hierarchical. So the question is, who's on top? Is it US? Is it China? And then from there, everything else deductively flows. But actually, if you want to understand power, and I think uh, Deleuze uh, and, and Guattari made a very interesting sociological contribution to that in the 70s and 80s, is that actually power flows in a rhizomatic way. It's non-linear, it's multi-layered, it moves in different directions. And what is the implications of that? I think the implications of that will be very clear when it comes to two developments. One development is climate change. Climate change, for instance, is gonna be so sweeping and so destabilizing and so disruptive that in some moments, I think either US and China will not be even relevant to discussions. You can imagine situations whereby Australia and Indonesia will cooperate to deal with these issues. You can imagine situations where US and China have to team up to deal with these kinds of problems. So hierarchical understanding of power is gonna be increasingly difficult and irrelevant in an area whereby you have so many overwhelming problems that require non-linear, uh, uh, horizontal cooperation among countries. Artificial intelligence is also gonna have a huge impact in the region, not only in the security realm. According to the International Labor Organization, uh, up to 56% of jobs in places like Cambodia, Philippines, and Indonesia could completely disappear because of the development of AI. And the reality is this, even if people can find new jobs, that's gonna be very psychologically stressful for people to change their jobs every other year. So I agree with our folks in ADB who came up with the study suggesting that, well, yes, AI will create new jobs, so don't worry about it, but shifting jobs is gonna be very stressful for people, and also the quality of jobs. Is it gonna provide the kind of jobs that is gonna give dignity, purpose, and most importantly, uh, a, a sense of tenure and stability to people. I very much doubt that. And these two will have so many secondary effects in terms of terrorism. In fact, if you wanna understand terrorism in the Middle East, you have to understand the ecology of the area. And if you look at the numbers, it's really frightening. Uh, seven out of 10 countries who are gonna be most affected by climate change are actually gonna be in, um, in Southeast Asia, in, in, in the Indo-Pacific region. A lot of major cities, in fact, in the chapter 10 of my book, I, I, the opening line is, some nations are gonna die before they get rich. That could be the case with Bangladesh. And some of the major cities, uh, uh, cities like um, Jakarta or even Manila, half of it could be underwater in the next two generations, if not one generation, if the current trends continue. So the other thing I'm saying is this, everyone is worried about China taking over and US-China competition, but we're losing uh, we're losing track of the forest for these two big trees in the middle of the forest. And I think this is something that we have to keep in mind as we move forward. Nonetheless, in the meantime, before we go into apocalypse, what's important is, I think, uh, for us, to wait, the, the way to move forward is this. I really do hope that our big powers, especially the United States, but also countries like Japan and Australia, when they talk about in the Pacific, they make it clear that this doesn't mean exclusion of ASEAN from the picture, that this is not a polite way of saying 
you guys, you failed to balance China, now it's time for the big boys to come in. This is very much the war in us. And if you look at the surveys and discussions among key policymakers in the region, there's a lot of skepticism about Indo-Pacific. They feel Indo-Pacific is actually a subterfuge for a containment strategy by the United States. Except containment is impossible for a country like China, which is so integrated in the global system. This is not Soviet Union, right? Um, and, and the other thing that you have to keep in mind is the necessity for accepting that perhaps ASEAN on the level of ASEAN organization, because the reality is ASEAN is really a small and medium enterprise. It's not European Union. It has a budget of $20 million. Uh, it's, it's a small and medium enterprise without human rights. That's, that's what ASEAN is. It has a budget of $20 million with, I think, 300 people as its uh, bureaucrats. So the ASEAN organization has very limited capacity. But key countries within ASEAN are huge countries. Indonesia is increasingly outgrowing ASEAN. It's already a member of G20 and is going to think about its global position as the largest Muslim country and one of the largest democracy. Philippines and Vietnam are going to be trillion dollar GDP economies in the next decade or so. So when we think about ASEAN, we should not think about the organization or the 10 ASEAN. We should, talk, we should think about cooperation and capacity building of key countries within the ASEAN. And that's where I talk about mini lateral engagement rather than multilateral engagement. Uh, you already see signs of that. Japan, Australia, India, all contributing to that, but we can have even more of that. But lastly, I think this is a very important thing. Um, I talked about a lot of things, and this is just 20% of the book, uh, but um, South China Sea is very, very important. I think this is definitely the tinderbox, the powder gag. The consensus among all countries should be that no single nation should have sole control in the South China Sea. That's the most important basic this is the floor that we have to talk about. And I think this is not clear yet. One of my disappointments from governments across Southeast Asia is they talk as if this is only a US-China competition. When in fact, this is about the interests of smaller countries. And in fact, there's more convergence between the interests of Philippines and US, Malaysia and US on this issue than between Philippines and China or Malaysia and China. This is a reality that, that, yeah, that ASEAN has to talk about. ASEAN always says we should not choose. But the reality is by not choosing, you're already making a choice. And on certain issues, ASEAN actually has made a choice. For instance, on trade issues, ASEAN has sided with China against the Trump administration, which they accuse of protectionism. So ASEAN has to make choice. And you know, in, in feminism, there's, there's a concept of intersectionality that you cannot understand one issue only through one dimension, that each issue has multiple dimension. For me, there's also something like strategic intersectionality. There are certain issues whereby the ASEAN has to stand its ground. There are certain issues we're closer to US. There are certain issues we're closer to China. And by not making a choice, we're actually making a choice. So I think there are a lot of cliche, hackneyed uh, mindsets in ASEAN that we have to break out if we're going to make sure that we don't have a failed revolution and the fascism of great power in the region. I think Jokowi's proposal for joint patrols Yes, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but the fact that it's coming out on such level is very important. I think Matthew's proposal for demilitarization is important. We have to build on that. And I think the negotiation of code of conduct should be tied to something even more important. In fact, I've given up hope on code of conduct. I'm worried about the legally binding code of conduct that benefits China, meaning Chinese version of legally binding. For me, what's more important is what the Philippines suggested back in 2013 uh, under Secretary Del Rosario, the notion of triple freeze. It doesn't make sense for ASEAN and China to negotiate code of conduct while facts on the ground are changing on an hourly, daily basis by China. Situation on the ground should be frozen as a good faith, good faith confidence building measure before we can talk about a code of conduct. So there should be no additional reclamation, no additional militarization, and no major naval exercises, especially by China in the area. And I think the way forward is what we call spoke to spoke cooperation. We should stop looking at what will U.S. do tomorrow. I think countries in the region themselves, if they pull their resources together and cooperate enough, they can send the right signal to China. This is not about containing China because we cannot do that. This is not about stopping China from growing because their growth is beneficial to us in a lot of ways. But this is about constraining and nudging China in a direction whereby their rise will be in consonance with the interests of smaller countries. This is the kind of inclusive security architecture that we want in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Richard. You've uh, taken us across a huge amount of terrain, issues, relationships, uh, and, and, and concepts. So uh, I realize that we're at about 26 minutes, 27 minutes till the time of closing. 
Uh, so for those who came in late, just to announce again the ground rules that we are on the record and uh, we are live streamed. So if you have a question or a comment to Richard, um, I propose that you just identify yourself and pose him the question or comment. We start with Nirmal and then with Ambassador Campbell and others. Thank you, Nirmal, Please, for, yeah. Nirmal from the Straits Times. Um, you mentioned Tsai Ing-wen very in, in passing. I was wondering what your view is on Taiwan, because you haven't mentioned Taiwan. Obviously, there's an election coming up on Saturday, so there's some apprehension. So I wonder what your views on that. Yeah, we can get a couple. Yeah. Sure, we can do that. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Campbell. Um, Piper Campbell, I was the head of the U.S. mission to to ASEAN last year. I'm curious whether you think that your proposal for minilateralism, mm -hmm. um, strengthened attention to Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, whether that, in fact, is the death knell of ASEAN, mm -hmm. because there's already, as you discussed, this divergence within or tensions within, and wouldn't that type of minilateralism actually um, exacerbate those tensions and pull ASEAN apart? And I couldn't help but just to add on to uh, Ambassador Campbell's comment that by suggesting a mini lateral between Singapore, Indonesia, and Vietnam, you also exclude two U.S. allies, the Philippines yeah. and Thailand. So I was wondering where you thought the role of alliances uh, for the United States would be. Uh, the final one, this side, I'm not a leftist. I'll come to the right. <laughs> uh, uh, Bella, our former visiting fellow. Bella, please. Uh, yes, so, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, you were talking about uh, uh, Japan's leading role in, you know, uh, infrastructure development in South Asia. So I wonder, what's your opinion, you know, on you know what can the United States and its you know allies and close partners can do, you know, can they work together to meet the need for infrastructure in South Asia? You got three. Why don't you take those and then? We'll yeah, let me the start one. with the uh, not because it's more important, but I, I think this is. This is where I get a lot of a lot of bashing. And one reason I'm not in Singapore now, but anyways, moving forward. Um, first of all, I think we, we have to get out of this straight jacket of we have to stick with ASEAN multilateralism no matter what. I think that's one reason ASEAN is not growing. Um, in fact, my argument is even more, I'm gonna push it even further. Philippines to its, I would call it constructive unilateral decision to take China to arbitration, to international arbitration, which was not supported by ASEAN. And everyone was wishy-washy, including within the administration of Aquino, including with the Philippines. Guess what? It now strengthens the hands of Vietnam. It now strengthens the hand of Indonesia, of Malaysia. And by the way, it strengthens the hand of ASEAN in the Code of Conduct negotiations. There's just no way that we can agree with the Code of Conduct that openly legitimizes the nine dash line. It's just impossible because now they can raise the Philippines' unilateral decision successfully to push for arbitration. So we already have a case whereby something on the unilateral level actually benefits everything on the multilateral level. Uh, so I don't believe in this mutual exclusivity. I believe actually they can be supplementary. If, uh, I won't be surprised if behind the scenes, uh, a lot of people rather have the South China Sea issue being outsourced strategically to the multilateral discussion. Because if you cannot do it on the multilateral level, if Cambodian Laos are not comfortable with it, why not do it on the multilateral level? I think not many will actually have big problems with that. Now, it is gonna offend certain symbolisms, but sometimes, in, in moments like this, in trying interesting moments like this, maybe you have to get out of your straight jacket. So I think that's something that is very important. And we also have these cases of what I call osmotic regionalism. So for instance, if you look at the counterterrorism convention, it was pushed on the national level, and then over time it was adopted on the regional level. One of the things I've been pushing for over the past decade is a code of conduct among ASEAN claimant states alone. Because Philippines, Vietnam, and Malaysia do not have fundamental disagreements on the on clause, conventional interpretation of on clause, and I would even say 99% of the arbitration award in 2016, which both of them are invoking directly and indirectly either in the extended continental shelf claim, questioning China's nine dash line, or Vietnam's modeling of arbitration award. So why not these countries themselves, right, already fix their boundaries based on their normal uh, and conventional interpretation of international law? And then we can shame China to say, this is a real code of conduct, maybe you wanna do something like that. Unfortunately, it's not happening because then again, we are worshiping this hackneyed multilateralism symbolism, which is not working. So I think a code of conduct, a real code of conduct among ASEAN claimant states makes sense at this point in time uh, for us to move forward. And that's where also I'm worried about the Philippine-China 
joint development proposals, because for sure China will try to use that to pressure Vietnam and Malaysia into similar arrangement, and that's why they're forcing the Philippines to agree to that, because they want to also use that as a basis for the contours of the final code of conduct that they have in mind by 2021 onwards. So there are many things that are moving here, but my fundamental argument is that unilateralism and minilateralism, far from being mutually exclusive with the relevance of ASEAN, sometimes they actually can help ASEAN ASEAN. And within ASEAN, I think there is some implicit understanding that you have to outsource certain issues that you cannot resolve on the ASEAN 10 level. So I think this is the position I have. It's not the most popular position, but I think not, not many people are creative enough to understand and appreciate that. But I'll continue my effort in this regard. Uh, when it comes to the Taiwan issue, while well, I spent time there um, last year as a visiting fellow in National Change University, well, <clears throat> The thing is, the Hong Kong protests have been a blessing to Chai Ing-wen. Now, of course, there are many reasons for numbers to go up, but we know in elections, it's just, you know, it's really the few little swings that will help you to win the day. And I think that really gave momentum to Chai Ing-wen to argue that, the, that what the Kuomintang party is implicitly accepting, which is one China, two system, is just not workable. All they have to do is just look at Hong Kong. In fact, they don't have to look at Hong Kong because Taiwan and Hong Kong protest movements are increasingly entwined since the Sunflower Movement in 2014 and 15, right? So what happens in Hong Kong very directly bears to the benefit of Chiang Wen and pro-independence movement there. And it's not also helping uh, Mayor Han at all. I mean, I'm, and I'm not sure Mayor Han was actually the best one for the comment on. I mean, he's, he, he got a lot of popularity out of nowhere, but his popularity also comes out of very questionable, including uh, accusations, perhaps quite legitimately, that his Facebook uh, algorithm uh, going up so, so crazily was, uh, you know, benefited by PLA cyber elements in, way inside mainland China. So in Viet uh, and if you look at the surveys, it's very clear that uh, the opinion of the Taiwanese people is also shifting back, especially among younger people, towards a sense of Taiwanness. It's not about uh, confronting China, but it's about drawing the line. And the other important development that ministers in Taiwan always, always want to focus on is decoupling. There's economic decoupling happening between Taiwan and China, and it's, it's a push and pull factor. On the part of China, they're taking out Taiwan because they're at the mid-range of the supply chain. So Taiwan is actually has to move out, and they're moving out more to Vietnam, Indonesia, and other countries in the region, and they have a southern policy also, just like South Koreans. So structurally and agentially, Taiwan is moving away from China. Now, who knows what's going to happen in four to eight years, but definitely it's going to give more headache to, to China. I really found it tone-deaf diplomacy when China just a few days ago said that, you know, that Hong Kong shows the something that, that the two-China model works for Taiwan or something like that. I thought this is a sarcastic joke, but apparently they did. So what happens in Hong Kong is directly bearing Taiwan, is helping Tsai Ing-wen. But the question is, what's going to happen after Tsai Ing-wen? And the big problem that they also have in Taiwan is, this is where the, 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 the sharp edge of China's sharp power is most apparent. It's essentially uh, patient zero. So being a Filipino, looking at 2022 elections, and being out, uh, from other folks who are concerned, you know, everyone talks about China, uh, Russian sharp power, Russian election interference. Taiwan is going to tell, uh, tell us a lot about Chinese election interference and China's sharp power. How they are, it's very interesting, like what they're doing, like the Chinese are so smart. They don't only try to like co op major media, they're also, also trying to co op uh, bloggers, influencers, celebrities who are actually even more influential than media people because most of them are apolitical, most of them are very personal. And as someone who's very active on social media, for better or for worse, um, it doesn't prevent me from writing books, but <laughs> uh, it distracts you a lot. I noticed that actually it's easier to influence public opinion when you're a non-political influencer person and you're on social media and you're more informal. And the Chinese are smart, they're learning that. One problem though for Chinese, and this is very important in social media when you want to make something viral, mastery of language. The Russians are way ahead of that. But China right now is more, more active in Hong Kong, Singapore, those places for their sharp power operations. But eventually they're going to graduate. So what happens in Taiwan, they're the fortress. And what happens there is going to have a ripple effect and it's going to give us an idea about what's going to happen in the rest of the region. As China worries about what's going to happen when our, when our boys are going to get kicked out of elections. I think what they got in Malaysia in 2018 was really a wake-up call when Najib was taken out. And, no less than Mahathir turned against China in the way he did. Uh, and they're going to worry about what's going to happen in the Philippines after the 13th, 2022, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, they, would, they should be also worried about Indonesia. I think if Prabowo won, he would have been a little bit more aggressive on China, not anti-China, but aggressive on China. So 
it's just, I think, inevitable that, that China will think about sharp power operations in the elections of other countries. Right. So that's where Taiwan is very, very important. There was a question about Japan again, infrastructure. Uh, I think Bella's question was about how how others can compete with China. Yeah, as I said, the competition is not dollar against dollar. By the way, in fact, my argument is that when it comes to China, people tend to forget the Chinese are better salesmen than capitalist nations. Um, China gets more bang out of imaginary buck. So for instance, in the Philippines, they, they offered $24 billion of investment. My question is, where is it? Where is it? I don't see it. I don't really see it. Um, so I, we have to really take with a grain of salt when China says, I'm gonna put $1 trillion, $4 trillion. And you know, once the Chinese shadow banking explodes, you see, I don't believe that China is gonna to collapse tomorrow. You know, no offense to some of our friends, but a structural slowdown in China it's going to be like a law of nature. It's inevitable that their economy is going to slow down. You know, when you travel a lot, like I'm sometimes in three continents in a week, you know what's the growth of a country by just the skyscrapers movement. I don't feel China is growing 6% when I visit the major cities. Maybe in Xinjiang, they're growing 15, 20%. But you already see in Beijing and Shanghai and other major cities, you feel a 2, 3% growth at most. It's already a slowing down economy. And as the country ages and welfare issues become more relevant, it's inevitable that China will need that money for their own development, rather than just throwing it at different projects right and left. You see, when Xi Jinping came to the Philippines in November 2018, everyone thought he's going to inaugurate some major project in the Philippines to win the hearts and minds of people. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. So it shows there are also structural limits to how much China can offer. At the same time, Japan is already moving forward. And, and Australia and India and other countries are pushing maybe not as much money, but they're investing in terms of regulatory capacity of countries to monitor infrastructure projects. Uh, I think the best way forward is for, for instance, the Philippines is suggesting, uh, kudos to some of our technocrats, they're suggesting joint projects, for instance, ADB China Japan project. For some reason, China doesn't want to do that. We don't know why. But I think that's the way forward because we in ASEAN don't want to be beholden to anyone, especially to China, right? Uh, and But we want the money still, but under different forms. So I think what Mahathir started gives a lot of inertia and momentum that could be used intelligently by other ASEAN countries. Uh, the, the Quad also pushed for, uh, together with Singapore, they pushed for also new p platforms of raising money from the private sector. So that's also something that you have to look at. Again, my point is like, you have to look at the big picture. And if you look at the big picture, there's so much constraints to China that that I think people overlook when they just look at, oh, $1 trillion from, US, uh, from, from, uh, from, uh, from China. And then like, I, I remember like when Wang Yi was trolling uh, Pompeo, when Pompeo suggested that he's gonna put 100 million and then uh, Wang Yi said, well, million? I thought it's 100 million. You know, like they would do things like that, but like $24 billion from China, where is it? I don't see it too. You know, I can troll them back to like that. So. I think we should do more of that trolling too. Uh, I'm following President Trump's tweets. I'm not seeing enough of trolling on that front. But I, I think we have to see that because the Chinese are getting more bang out of imaginary buck. You see the US FDI stock in Southeast Asia is I think $350 billion. It's more than China, I think, and Japan combined. And if you combine Japan, US, and EU, and Australian uh, FDI stock in ASEAN, China is, is almost pathetic in terms of their investment. But no one knows about it. Very few experts know about that, right? Because we're not doing enough of public diplomacy. Ironically, China is better in public diplomacy than our capitalist friends. I don't know why, no? So, but we have to do that. We have to remind people what's out there. So my impression is that, you know, Japan, the United States are working individually in helping a Southeast Asian country. No, there's so a quad transparency initiative uh, already. So we see individually efforts, but we're seeing also efforts on the multilateral level and together with ASEAN. I think two years ago, uh, Australia signed an investment agreement with ASEAN, which focused really on the sustainability question. And it's having an impact because China is also adjusting that. We saw on the AIIB issue that China adjusted when they were pushed back. Because initially China wanted to have veto power essentially on all important decision making process. Because of pushback from 2012 to 2014, eventually China had to adjust it, then the British came in and then most countries went along. I think the AIB experience tells us that perhaps if you push back enough, China will make enough adjustments also in BRI. And then of course they'll find another thing to do their own imperial design. But we have to constantly push back. We have to be ADHD in terms of our strategic engagement with China. Otherwise, we're gonna get outsmarted, yeah. Let me go to this side. There were some questions, were there? So, I did right wing, I, like, I thought there were some questions on this side. Yes, sir, please. 
Tom Parker, George Washington University. Did you mention anything about the maritime operations of countries uh, uh, in addition to the United States? Yeah. Then maybe two, two questions. Uh, was there another one in the back? Oh, yes. Hey, hi, Desmond, please. Hi, thank you, Richard. It's great, uh, great as always. Desmond from the St. Paul Embassy. Sure. Um, I wanted to pick up on the um, section in your presentation where you spoke about some of the institutional strengths but also institutional deficits in ASEAN. And I was wondering if you could comment specifically about ASEAN enlargement. Um, mm. You know, as you would know, Timor Leste is applied to you know, be a member of ASEAN. I was wondering how you think ASEAN should position itself mm. vis a vis you know, that particular application for membership. How do you think that will affect the integrity of the institution as a whole? Yeah, I think I need more bottles of water. <laughs> 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 okay, uh, okay um, first on the question when it comes to maritime policy of other countries. Um, I think one of the things I didn't have time to discuss, but I discussed this in my book and works, is also the growing presence of our European friends in the area, including Italians. And there were even discussions of Germans sending some operations in the Taiwan Straits. Now, you see, on, on, on a one-to-one -one basis, all of these operations are pathetic, but when you put them together, it's very important. The importance of Europeans coming in is that, first of all, it shows this is not a US-China game. This is about international community, international law and norms versus China's revisionism. This is, this is very important. So on a symbolic level, and symbolism matters a lot for the Chinese, it's important for our French partners and British partners and other European partners to have access operations. Not maybe 12 nautical miles, but moving within 12, 24 nautical miles in itself is enough for now. I think that's a very important thing that is happening. The second thing is uh, last year, June, I think it was June, uh, EU signed a strategic agreement with Vietnam. It's one of very few defense strategic agreements that EU has in the region. I think the other one is South Korea and Australia. This is very relevant. It goes back to the question you raised. In fact, one of the ironies I, I, I noticed, perhaps it's not even ironic, is that the more reliable partners for the US and like-minded countries are the more authoritarian countries. Like, if you look at it, Singapore and Vietnam sometimes are even more reliable. Show me first of them. Singapore is democratic, <laughs> but these countries seem to be more reliable than, let's say, countries like the Philippines and, and Thailand, you know, or treaty allies and have a messy, uh, messy domestic politics. But, but, but the fact of the matter is that when you talk about multilateralism, it has to encompass all of these key countries. And ironically, sometimes it seems that the U.S. is even closer to Vietnam on certain issues than in the Philippines, particularly in the South China Sea, as we see today. But you have to engage all of these countries. And as I showed a while ago in the brief time I had, when it comes even to the Philippines, despite having a president like President Duterte, the major institutions like the defense establishment are still maintaining right, the sinews of the alliance there. Uh, in terms of maritime policy, you also saw, for instance, a kind of quadrilateral. So when, when we talk about quad, it's always like India, Japan, US, and Australia, but you're having other alternative permutations of quad. So for instance, you had the quasi uh, phone ops operations whereby Philippines, Japan, uh, India, and US together did an operations last year. So these permutations are very important because on the symbolic level, they say that this is not US and China, this is an international community's concern. And this is also signaling to China that they're not the only game in town, that there are other countries who are going to be in the region and they're going to watch out what's going to happen. And I always tell our European friends, this is not a question of billions of dollars. This is a question of millions of dollars of investment and assistance to Philippine Coast Guard, to Vietnam Coast Guard, because one of the fundamental problems we have in the South China Sea is domain awareness. You know, it's one thing to talk about uh, fighting against China. It's another thing to talk about knowing what the hell are the Chinese doing within your waters, right? So sometimes we have to rely on American friends to give, that, give us that kind of information. So domain awareness, awareness development is something that should be given credit to, and Japan and other partners are doing very much help to push us in ASEAN to know what the hell is happening in our waters before we push back against China. I think down the road is also very important for us to get the necessary capability to do our own A2AD, our own anti-access area denial, asymmetrical counter responses to China. In fact, not only in Vietnam, but in the Philippines, among the naval strategic community, there's more and more discussion about the Philippines developing asymmetrical capabilities against China. So then again, just like BRI, it's not about matching the Chinese on a dollar to dollar, on a warship to warship basis. It's about meeting a basic threshold of domain awareness and minimum deterrence, as we call it in the Philippines, to give the Chinese a pause and second thought about what they're doing. My fundamental concern right now today is China is, you know, is alienating many countries in many ways, but for some reason, the United States right now is not making the most out of it. And it's not because we're against China, we want a balance to China. And I think what's happening in the Middle East, for instance, is very, very disturbing to us because we're worried about the United States getting even bogged down even more 
Because Iran is a different, completely different ballgame than Afghanistan and Iraq ever were. So what's happening in the Middle East right now is again worrying us about where the direction of the U.S. will be. But then again, if you if you look at it, we should not only look at the U.S., but if you, for instance, put the GDPs of Indonesia, India, and Japan together and project it to the next 20 years, that can match that of China. So middle powers alone, I think, they can hold the line. And this brings me back to Narendra Modi's, Prime Minister Modi's speech in Shanghai Dialogue in 2018. It was a very interesting speech. I mean, Indians are always like that. They go both ways. But, but one of the things I like about it is, essentially the message of Prime Minister Modi, maybe I'm too ch charitable on that, is that yes, we're moving into a post-American world, as Zakaria would try to put it, but that post-American world will not necessarily have to be a Pax Sinica dominated by China. Because you have enough like-minded middle powers from Korea, ASEAN to, to India, among others, who can hold the line together because they also have an interest to make sure that China will not fill in the vacuum. I think these are the other things that you have to keep in mind. What was the other question? That's a good question. Yeah, Singapore. Expanding ASEAN yes, to include Timor Leste. Yeah, I saw in one of the leak, <laughs> WikiLeaks that uh, Prime Minister Lee said something like, when we accepted Cambodia, it pushed us back 20 years or something like that. So I would have. A, I, I don't know what he will say if East Timor gets uh, admitted. Is it going to push us back 40 years or so? Um, I, I, you know, I love East Timor because they're among the few fellow Catholic Latinos we have in Southeast Asia. And I always joke as a Filipino, I feel more at home in Mexico than Malaysia. Uh, we're much more similar to them in culture and mindset and all. Um, I think the reality of ASEAN is that we have to expand horizontally, meaning perhaps more countries should come in. We have to accept that East Timor is geopolitically and historically part of the region, but we also have to uh, get more stratified vertically. What do I mean? I think the idea of a two-speed ASEAN is increasingly a de facto reality. You have, essentially, ASEAN 6 is so different from the rest, right? So if East Timor comes in, you're going to have an ASEAN 5 versus an ASEAN 6. Because Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, and Thailand are completely different ballgame. So at, at two speed, just like EU, a two speed reality is, I think, the future in ASEAN. Uh, the problem is that it's just not politically correct. So we have a lot of PC, our own version of PC in ASEAN, and I think it's good to have non PC folks like Dilahari among others doing that. And I'm trying to contribute to that. I think it's time for innovative ideas. Uh, unfortunately, I think there are a lot of folks who have a lot of stake in keeping ASEAN the way it is, but I, I'm not sure it's helping us. If you look at the ASEAN uh, outlook on the Indo-Pacific document, I mean, great that we came up with a common document, and I think we have to give a lot of credit to Indonesia uh, on that. Uh, I think Marty Nataragawa did a good job starting it, getting the ball rolling from 2030. But if you look at the document, I mean, when I'm reading it, it's almost laughable because, not because it's pathetic, but it's because it's overly defensive. It's defensive in a sense saying, hey, hey, we are also relevant, don't forget about us. <clears throat> but it's one thing to say, don't forget about that, us. It's another thing doing something to make sure that they don't forget about us. So I think that uh, AO, AOIP is important in reminding us, er, everyone, that the Indo-Pacific should not be exclusionary, but it also should remind ASEAN that we should do enough of innovation internally, endogenously, to make sure that we become an engine of the creation of the Indo-Pacific security architecture in the most inclusive way possible that does not take out the interests of smaller countries. I want to add another small thing. Uh, there's a lot of China bashing going on in the Pacific, but one of the things that is, under, uh, uh, is, not, is overlooked is India, particularly when it comes to Indian economic protectionism. So if you look at the, uh, uh, the, uh, the trade negotiations right now going on, it's really India who's holding back. Right. Uh, so I think we also have to be a little bit critical about, with our Indian friends. Yes, they may have a democracy. Well, we can have a debate about whether they're still democracy. But uh, the fact of the matter is that India is not also helpful when it comes to economic regionalism in this part of the world. And we have to be also honest with our friends. That's why I say the way forward is strategic intersectionality. We should not look at any country or any issue only from one dimension. Each issue and each country has different dimension and ASEAN has to make different choices depending on the issue at hand and depending on the time and space we're talking about. And that's, for me, dynamic balancing that is very much lacking, even discursively, with the level of ASEAN. This is my point of view. And we had one question from maybe last from Ambassador Al Laporta. This may be the last question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem, Al, please. Uh, Al Laporta, retired State Department. Um, I've long felt that one of the weaknesses of ASEAN in the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the South China Sea has been the failure of the claimant countries, other than China, to come together and start resolving their own problems. Yeah. 
Uh, I suspect that if you really wanted to hear some gasps, uh, gasps in, in Beijing, that starting negotiations to resolve those problems on a bilateral or trilateral basis would have a real effect. That's a real message uh, to uh, China. What do you think of, or the other part is the fishing, fisheries regime. ASEAN starting to negotiate a fisheries regime uh, for the region would, I think, set the Chinese back a great deal. Now, what, what do you, I mean, building on the else question, what many reasons are given for why this has not occurred over the last decade? Many, many reasons. Uh, ongoing claims against each other, suspicions of each other, lack of salience of the issue. I mean, really, in national politics in Southeast Asia, South China Sea is comparatively you know, uh, a minor issue on the scheme of national priorities. Mm -hmm. What is your accounting for why as you say, you're, you're showing a lot of data for us today that suggests that there's a hardening of position, Matthew's sequencing, uh, Indonesia's movement, uh, Vietnam's clear movement, especially as it takes the ASEAN chairmanship, just as it did a decade ago, it moved the issue forward. Why can't they come to an agreement? Their continental shelf claims are roughly aligned. Their interpretations of UNCLOS are roughly aligned. Their need for protein stocks is roughly aligned. Their need for domain, maritime domain awareness is roughly aligned. Why not go the extra step and at least <clears throat> set up a formal process of negotiations that would be taken seriously by external countries, including China? Can I take one more question? So if there's, was, was there, there one more? I don't believe there was. I think Alice was, was the okay. last. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because that was more of a comment. Um, I would like to discuss the environmental issue also, very important, uh, because the Chinese are also very worried about this. Um, well, as far as the South China Sea issue is concerned and why there's not sufficient coordinated response, I think it's uh, it's an offshot of at least three factors, right? I mean, just, I'm thinking about it right away. Uh, the first thing is that it did not settle into the national consciousness. I mean, as a public educator, it's very interesting that only in the past two or three years, but I'm very you know, encouraged by this, is that now I'm having discussions on UNCLOS with taxi drivers going to airports. So some of them, them recognize me and they say, um, Mr. Idar, I disagree with your interpretation of UNCLOS. You're going to create war with China. And I'm, I'm very Socratic, so I never disagree with people. I just throw back questions at them until they realize they don't know what they're talking about. Right? That's what Socrates did in Agora. And then they say, you know what, I don't know about this, but I heard this from President Duterte on the radio over and over again. So maybe he's influential in creating a little bit fuzziness there. But nonetheless, for the first time in a very, for the first time in ways I never imagined, ordinary people are talking about on clause international law, South China Sea. And this for me is very encouraging. And I think Philippines is way ahead of everyone on that, precisely because we filed an arbitration award against China, and perhaps there's almost Unfortunately, too much xenophobia also against China on this issue. So we're creating a nationalism around that. But in more and more countries, that consciousness is coming in. And that consciousness is coming in, especially with uh, these uh, images of ordinary fishermen being killed or harassed. This is something that resonates with people a lot. And this is where the role of the media is important. I think that's one thing. Uh, national consciousness has come late. While China has already developed this since the introduction of patriotic education in 1993. So for almost 30 years, China has been nailing into the head of their people. This is my, my experience. Dealing with older Chinese academics is easier because the younger ones are the more brainwashed ones on this. Because the older ones know that Jiang Zemin could negotiate with 10, 10, 12 countries. They know this is like a mumbo jumbo. But the younger ones are much more brainwashed and harder to deal with them. And I think patriotic education program is very much an effect of that. We didn't have that. So this is one. Second thing is it's also an upshot of um, the absence of a robust epistemic community. Uh, only now I see that you know folks from Philippines, from Indonesia, Malaysia coming together, discussing these ideas in ways that we can also influence policy making. You know, like it's one thing for academics to come, but it's another thing to have track 1.5 influential thinkers who have the ears of their defense ministers and foreign ministers and leaders to come together. That was not as much present. It's only coming together right now. So I think this is the other issue, the, the upshot of that. And the third thing you have to keep in mind is ASEAN was never a supranational organization. It was a supranational organization with national priorities and particular economic development priorities almost predominated. So 
When China offers you billions of dollars and implicitly threatens war with you over these disputes, the automatic instinct of smaller countries is to sue for uh, accommodation, <laughs> right? But the reality is, it's like contra chef cycle, right? In the contra chef cycle, if you look at it, the, there'll be ups and downs, but within the ups and downs, there's a certain trajectory. And the trajectory is that even though there's more and more accommodation here and there, etc., there's growing nationalism on the South China Sea issue. There's more pressure on the governments to stand up to this issue. There's more robust development of a strategic culture in Southeast Asian countries, which is not present there. That is why you're seeing the things I was mentioning a while ago. That is why you're suddenly seeing Malaysia submitting a second extended continental claim. You're seeing Vietnam openly threatening legal, uh, legal arbitration. You're seeing Indonesia saying that the nine national has no basis. And it's possible that the Philippines will swing back again or swing halfway back in the next years or so, perhaps even under President Duterte, if things develop in a certain direction. So I'm, my point is, it's what we're having right now is not an ideal collective resistance, but we're whimpering our way into that collective resistance in a certain way. And I think that's something that has to be taken notice. And that's why minilateralism matters. That's why engagement between us in key ASEAN countries and our counterparts in US in East West Center, in Europe, and other matters, because it gives us the confidence and coherence of thought to go back to our own home constituencies and policy markets and say, we have to work this together, otherwise we're not going to move forward. From my personal experience, I talk to Prime Minister Matir, I talk to senior officials in Vietnam, I talk to former senior officials in the Philippines, everyone was on board on the issue of developing perhaps our own version of the Code of Conduct, yeah. at least in principle. The problem right now is, the Philippines, which was the most aggressive country behind it, is now under President Duterte. So this is now a major kind of a roadblock. Perhaps absent that, if you have a different leadership in the Philippines, it's more probable that we'll move in that direction of in terms of collective resistance. Again, this is not to exclude China, but this is to nudge China towards respecting the rights of smaller countries, especially their legitimate rights. And the reality is that smaller countries do have agencies, and let's not forget also about the role of middle powers like Japan, India, and Australia, who are also joining the fray. Thank you very much. Well, we've had an absolute fascinating hour and a half. Thank you so much. For I really appreciate you coming here. I would remind you again that the book is available from Palgrave Macmillan. Uh, we don't have any copies to sell today, but you, know, you can get it online, order it online. And uh, Richard, we look forward to your next visit. Thank you all for joining us again. Happy New Year, and stay tuned if you're not on our mailing list for programs, publications, events, scholarships, fellowships, uh, and you want to be. There is a little sign-up sheet uh, box right outside to the uh, outside the elevators, so feel free to leave your card or something, and we can put you on our list. We don't put anyone on our list who doesn't want to be on our list. But thank you again for joining, and we'll look forward to seeing you at future programs. Thanks so much.